Thank you. Thank you all for receiving the communion together today. It means a lot. The Bible is really full of types and shadows, symbols, in other words. But the symbol is the simplest way to point to a more complex reality. That's what all the emojis are. This little smiley face. Yeah. Thanks, Kelly. Keith, God bless you guys. We love you, man. Thanks. We good? I don't take my lunch there. That, that my lunch you're... Uh, Uh, thank you. Thank you. Boy, what people. What people. No matter what the skeptics may say or think they know, you cannot explain away a changed life. A life that just is empowered from above. It's proof positive of the reality of God. It's not a 30 day wonder. But I was just thinking the Lord, the Lord being the master, the master teacher, preacher, prophet, the master of all things, the master of the wind. He was the best, the very best at simplifying complex things. He came when the people for hundreds of years had been living under a system that was a system of law. And really just, just that is as complicated as you ever want to be. <laughs> if you think law is not complicated... Have you ever watched, like, the legislature work? <laughs> work, I, I, I say uh, euphemistically there. <laughs> 500 people will spend five years writing one sentence. And 50,000 lawyers will make a living debating that sentence. Law is that way. Law makes an attempt to take a perfect position and lay down perfect boundaries. But the law is written by imperfect people and imposed on imperfect people. And that's why it's so messy. So any attempt to be saved by that is doomed before it starts. We need grace. A week ago was Easter, wasn't it? It seems like it was years ago. 
just seven days ago. Boy, what a busy time it was and is. Have you ever heard the term? I know you have. It's a rhetorical question. Postpartum depression. It's like what your pets do when you leave the house. Um, you come back. <laughs> you wonder if anyone survived. <laughs> I see you know about that. This is a, you know, it, it, I don't mean to make light of that because, you know, it is, there is no such thing as, as a desirable or a light depression. The word is somber enough itself, but it's postpartum. It's after someone parts, the parents or the children, and then you're left with this chasm of emotion. It can be difficult. Postpartum depression. But we're here today for a postpartum celebration. When the Lord announced to his disciples that he'd be leaving soon, they began to react in ways that were predictable. But he assured them that he would not leave them as orphans. That in due time, 50 days to be exact, the Comforter would come, the Holy Spirit would come to take his place. And when that happens, the Holy Spirit will speak of Jesus. And the advantage, the obvious, simple advantage is... The Holy Spirit would be in all places at all times on call. Where Jesus was one man, one place at a time. Though he is God in the flesh, he is still in the flesh. But the Holy Spirit is not. So don't worry, I'm leaving you in good hands. And that celebration came, I don't want to get ahead of myself, I'm looking forward to that 50th day of Pentecost. But we're in good hands here until we see him face to face again. When you do this, remember... He's coming again. I want to read some scripture right in church. Of all places. The book of John, uh, chapter 20. I want to say this in my usual smart alecky way. If you haven't been reading your Bible lately, you're supposed, you're supposed to feel guilty. That was my whole point. A little guilt goes a long ways. Borrow someone's Bible and read John chapter 20. It'll help you. The resurrection. We are post-resurrection now. That was a week ago. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, that would be John, 
the one whom Jesus loved. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, she said, and we do not know where they have put him. Then Peter and the other disciples set out for the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. John got there first. He bent down and looked in at the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Simon Peter arrived just after him. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The cloth that had been around Jesus' head, the cloth that had been around Jesus' head was rolled up, lying separate from the linen cloths. So most of you all, well, well, I wasn't there, I can't say for sure. <laughs> but it is generally agreed that there is a custom, a, a Jewish custom here um, that typifies this scene of the cloth laying there separate, folded up or rolled up, depending on which translation you read, to the side, laying there away from the grave clothes. And the, the custom is this, is that the master of the house at the table, as he's having dinner, for some reason he needs to leave the room. Maybe he gets a text message, I don't know. But he needs to step away from the table. But he's coming back. So what he will do is take his napkin and fold it up and lay it beside of his plate and then dismiss himself, excuse himself. And then the servant waiting on the side, when they see that, they'll know not to clear the table. Wait, he's coming back. If the master is not coming back, when he's through, he would just use the napkin, wad it up, throw it on the table. And then, of course, the servant will know to come and clean, clear the table. So Jesus, by leaving this napkin folded there, was saying to his servants, he'll be back. And that's the story behind that, the tradition behind that. Simon Peter arrived just after him. He entered the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there. The cloth that had been around Jesus' head was rolled up, lying separate from the linen cloths. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For they still did not understand from the scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. It's not easy to, I mean, this is not uh, something that you see every day. Then the disciples returned to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb weeping. This is Mary Magdalene. And as she wept, she bent down to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head, the other at the feet. Woman, why are you weeping, they asked. Because they have taken my Lord away, she said, and I do not know where they have put him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not recognize that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you weeping? Jesus asked. Whom are you seeking? Thinking he was the gardener. She said, Sir, if you have carried him off, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Now, there are lots of high points in this you probably have heard or seen for yourself. But this phrase here, thinking that he was the gardener. Jesus is one of us. He didn't put on airs. I don't think he wore a clergy collar, none of this. Not that that's wrong. Believe me, that could be real convenient. But he was just the gardener. I can't begin to tell you how many times people have pulled up here at the church and they see me and they assume I'm the gardener. 
They see me doing something that gardeners do. I don't look like a pastor. I don't act like one. If I wasn't, if I didn't just look around and trust the Lord, I wouldn't even think I was one. And I certainly am not a gardener. We're using that as, just as an example. But to just be one of us. And to fit in with us. Jesus is a good fit in this room. Did you know that? How many times have I told you, you're a good fit here? We all fit in the same body. Because we belong to the same family. We have the same father. He is our brother. He is not ashamed of us. He's not ashamed to be seen with us. He's not mad or angry at us. He's not disappointed. He's not all this goofy stuff that preachers tell you. He's none of that. He's the gardener. He understands. He lives where we live. He's been where we are. So Mary, he's already speaking to Mary. Mary looks at him and assumes he's the gardener. What else? Who else would be here in a cemetery? And then Jesus said to her, Mary. When he called her name, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Reboni, Reboni which means teacher. The word now in modern contemporary uh, language or Judaism, whatever you want to say, is more commonly rabbi is used more common than anything. We call it rabbi. Really, the correct pronunciation is rabbi. But since no one says that, I'm not going to do it. I tried saying Isaiah, I mean Isaiah, for I don't know how many years because that's the correct um, pronunciation of it, but I was the only guy saying this, so finally I gave up. Okay, you all want Isaiah? You can have Isaiah. I don't care. So ra rabbi, as we say, means teacher generally. Now, you can get a lifetime study just out of this, but it's enough just to hit it and move on. Rabbi means teacher. This is the only time this word is used here. And it means my teacher. Rabbi means literally the great teacher. When you see this other prefix, rabboni, it's like, and you see this a lot in Hebrew, to emphasize a word, they just say it twice. So Rabboni literally means he is the great, great teacher. My great, great teacher. No one else said that. There's no record of that. But when he called her name, she knew who he was. Not until then. She wouldn't be expecting to see him out walking around. He's dead. And she certainly didn't expect to hear her name. But when she heard that, when she heard that voice, what did Jesus say? I'm the good shepherd. My sheep know my voice. In order to know his voice, you had to hang around with him a while. You had to spend some time there and get to recognize his voice. Hallelujah. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned to him and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Do not cling to me, Jesus said, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go and tell my brothers, I am ascending to the Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the, to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said to her. It was the first day of the week. What's the first day of the week in our calendar? Sunday, you're in it. 
And that very evening, while the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them. Peace be with you. I omitted even announcing the title, but the title is Jesus Stands Among Us. I have my title written out, Postpartum Celebration, Jesus Stands Among Us, but I was afraid that was too controversial and didn't want to say it. So, Jesus stands among them and says, Peace with you or shalom. He said to them, after he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said to them, Shalom, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so also I am sending you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. The word for breath is the same word for spirit and also the same word for wind, depending on the context. He breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The Greek says he breathed into them. It's like artificial resuscitation. He breathed his spirit into these people. The first man, Adam became a living being the same way. God breathed his spirit into this lifeless lump of clay and he became a living soul. This is exactly what's happening here. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. So there's authority coming here. Jesus appeared to Thomas. Now Thomas called Didymus... One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. You know, I told you last week, he skipped church that day. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails had been, put my hand into his side, I will never believe. Thomas. Eight days later, his disciples were once again inside with the doors locked. And Thomas was with them this time. Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom, peace be with you. The doors were locked. He came in anyway. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas never said anything yet. He said it last week. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas replied, my Lord and my God. Not based on the scars, not based on, based on his word, his voice. He knew it was the Lord by his voice. Jesus said to him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. The purpose of John's book, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name, John chapter 20. Hallelujah. Wow. You should read it sometime. It's a wonderful book. When Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, they were hiding behind locked doors, fearing what the authorities might do next. I mean, after all, they had just killed Jesus. But no locked door could stop Jesus from re-entering their lives, proving himself to be their Savior and their eternal hope. Jesus could be seen, heard, and touched. He enters our lives in the same tangible manner. Once we receive the Holy Spirit. If you can't see Him, you don't have your new eyes yet. You can't hear Him, you don't have your new ears yet. You can't sense His presence, you need His Spirit for all of this. 
You can't do it with your mind or your intellect. No matter how smart you think you are, you can't. No matter where we've been or what we've done, Christ can enter through our fears and doubts by simply declaring, Shalom, peace be with you. 1 Corinthians 1.22 The Jews demand signs and Greeks search for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So God, man thinks he's something when really he's nothing. If he had turned to God, God would make him something. Jews have, seen, Jews have to see it with their own eyes before they will accept it. Greeks have to confirm that it doesn't conflict with their superior intellect first. They won't buy it if they don't think it's right because they're smarter than any book, Bible, or fable. Jews have to see it in the physical realm. Greeks have to see it in the intellectual realm. Neither the physical realm or the intellectual realm have any saving grace. Both the Jew and the Greek are lost without a spiritual revelation of Jesus Christ, period. Thomas was a doubter. Maybe you doubt as Thomas did. Quick to question everything that you can't see or touch. Anybody like that? Questions can be good and healthy, but a questioning nature, a questioning spirit, is a serious stumbling block to faith. A questioning spirit. Well, why this? Why that? Why did this happen? Why did that? Why did they have to kill him? He didn't do it. Why all the blood? Why did this happen that way? Why do we have to do this? Why do we have to do that? Why? I wonder why. I wonder why. A questioning spirit is a huge distraction. Faith comes by hearing the Word of God. And while the Word of God is coming, you're not hearing, you're questioning. You're questioning everything before taking time to hear it through. Amen. It's not just inquisitive nature. Every sentence almost is like, why? Or why not? Why? Well... You know, it was 40 degrees on opening day. At <laughs> I started to say Tiger Stadium. Why does it have to always be so cold on opening day? Why this? Why that? Do you realize how foolish this is? Get this out of your system. The Bible says be quick to hear, slow to speak. Don't in a split second have a question for everything that you hear. Give yourself a fair chance for faith to come. Faith takes a while sometimes, but it has to come if you keep hearing. I heard for several years, you know, how bad cigarette smoking was and all this. I don't know how long. It's not that I didn't know it. Everybody knows it. Nobody's that stupid. But I kept hearing it, kept hearing it, kept hearing it. And then finally one day, it clicked. It didn't the day before, but it did that day. Faith came. The light came on. And I was converted. I was changed. I gave myself a chance. I kept reading. I kept reading. I kept studying. I kept studying. 
You say, you should quit smoking, it's bad for you. Yeah, I know. You don't know. You do not know. Tell me exactly what happens when you do. You can't do it. I'm just using that as an example. And you ought to quit, too. We all got things we ought to quit. That's definitely as high on the list as anything I can think of. But a questioning spirit leaves you so vulnerable and wide open to every conspiracy theory, video, internet, this, that. Everything on earth is going to fill your head. And you will not only have room for the word of God, you don't even have an interest anymore because you are way beyond that now. Paul said, I'm ad-libbing a little bit, okay? Paul said, I have enough degrees, I could paper my walls with it. There's nobody exceeding or excelling what I've been able to do in Judaism. And then he listed his credentials from birth. And all that he'd done and the way he persecuted the church, even had Christians killed. All of this was for God. He believed with as much zeal as any man could ever imagine. He believed he was right. Fighting for God, he thought. Committing murder. But he believed he was right. And then he heard the voice. He heard about Jesus. He was looking for all those followers. He'd have killed Jesus in a second if he could have found him. He was blinded by the light. He heard the voice. He saw the light. Those around him saw the light. I may have this backwards. But they didn't hear the voice that Paul heard. Paul said, who are you? He said, I'm the one you've been persecuting. With as much zeal and fervor as he'd had against Christ, he soon had turned it the other way. And here was his testimony. This is the moral of this whole scenario I'm laying out here, trying to. Paul said, with everything, with all my credentials, with everything that I could be doing and teaching and preaching, and all of my great theological wherewithal, I have made it my mission in life from, from that day forward to know nothing but Christ and Him crucified. Period. If you have to know more than that, you will have to abandon that first. If you are a Christian, I strongly urge you, come back to the cross. Come back to the crucifixion. Come back and take another look. Come back and shut down all the other voices and see if you can hear Him. See if you even remember the sound of His voice, if you hear it again. Do you even recognize it anymore? You can't be caught up in everything else. Good, bad, or ugly. Doesn't matter. It's something else. It might be another preacher. It might be another teaching. It might be anything else. It might be good and wonderful things. But it's something else instead. Paul said nothing but Christ crucified. 
That's the gospel that I live and die for. We want to jazz our Christianity up with all the extramarital stuff. I shouldn't say extramarital, extracurricular. <laughs> it's not so hard to take that way. Do you hear what I'm saying? Does this make any sense? We're in everything under the sun. But in order to do so, we had to abandon the cross again. Oh, it's there. Oh, I, knew, I know the Lord. When's the last time you heard his voice? You still recognize his ring when he calls? Thomas was a doubter. Questions can be good and healthy. Thomas said, I, I won't believe unless I can put my finger in your scars. Jesus replied, here you are. Go ahead. He didn't do that. Just his voice. My Lord and my God. You cannot know his voice amongst all the din of everything else going on continuously. You got a steady stream of stuff all day long. And they're all, oh, you got to see this. You got to see that. Oh, did you know about this? Did you know about that? I don't know anything. Nothing. At all. But Christ and Him crucified. That's all I know. I only have one lifetime. Let me give it to this. I know what I'm saying by the Spirit. By the Spirit of God, I know what I'm saying here. Here you are, Thomas. He didn't need to scar. He just needed to hear his voice. Psalm 34 and 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in Him. There's no refuge in extracurricular stuff. None of, it's all good. There's all a place. There's a place for everything. Solomon was clear on that. There's a time and a purpose and a season and a place for everything under the sun. But nothing, there's no place for anything until Christ is crucified in you first. Amen. And the rest of this stuff, you'll lose interest. If you don't find Christ interesting enough to hold your attention, your entire attention, I doubt if you've ever seen or heard this man. He is an all-consuming fire. He ruined my appetite for everything else. I don't eat junk food after feasting on Him. I've tasted and seen that the Lord is good. I have to have this meat now. Test Him. Check Him out. He can stand it. Jesus can withstand any scrutiny. The world has been trying to discredit the divinity of Christ and the Bible since the beginning. But there are more Christians now than ever. And the Bible is the all-time number one selling book of all times that have ever been sold since there are books. Amen. And then, and then the, the geniuses. Oh, it's not one book, it's 66 books. Uh, yeah. Let me give you one of them. And you give me everything you have. Let you and I go to a, a desert island, deserted island. I don't know if there's any such thing as a desert island. Okay. And I, all I know is Christ and Him crucified. And you bring all your degrees. Bring a U-Haul if you have to. And, we're go and it's just you and me. 
And let's see. Let's see who converts who. Let's see if all your superior intellect will cause me to diminish my light for Christ. Oh, I see now. I've just been um, narrow-minded. This is proof positive. No man who has ever seen Christ for himself has ever turned to Buddha, Mohammed, a million Shinto gods, no holy cows in India. When you see Christ, you have found your car keys. Nobody keeps looking after you find the key. After you're born again, you give up auditioning churches and more churches and more churches and more churches and more preachers and more TVs and more videos and more internet. No, no. Forget all of that. One thing only. Christ and Him crucified. Start there. You can never turn me off of Christ, but you can't be around me for too much longer until you're turned on to him. And if you don't believe it, come see me. It's not that I'm smarter than you. I have the spirit that you don't know anything about. And if you don't think I have the advantage, then I have the advantage. You don't know my invisible partner. <laughs> we have all these Bibles. Now if we could only get people to read them. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Thomas was a doubter. Peter was a denier. Maybe you're a denier like Peter. Quick to hide your relationship with Christ. But then quick to feel guilty about it. You embarrassed by Christ. Not ashamed of him, are you? No. Your kids, they'll embarrass you. <laughs> but you're not ashamed of them. Jesus is not ashamed to call you brother. He took your shame. Jesus chose Peter who had been so close to him but crumbled before the servant girl to help establish his church that we are a part of today. Matthew 16, 13, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he questioned his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you? Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, or Bar-Jonah. Y'all remember that Wednesday night? Barabbas, B-A-R is a prefix, means son of. You have Bar Jesus, Bar Jonah, Bar Abbas. Barabbas' first name was Jesus. Jesus Barabbas. So who do you want released today? Jesus Barabbas? Or Jesus the King of the Jews? Jesus Christ. Which Jesus do you want? You want a Baptist Jesus? Is that enough? Is that all you can stand? You want a Catholic Jesus? You want a Pentecostal Jesus? What brand of Jesus did you have in mind?
Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. You didn't learn this in seminary. You may know the right answer by reading the right book and pass the test. But how do you know it's true? Oh, it was revealed to you by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades, or hell, will not prevail against it. So what is the rock that Jesus referred to? Be glad that Peter or any man but Christ is not that rock. I don't want to disappoint you. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I love you. I love the Catholic Church. There's nothing or no one, I shouldn't say nothing, there's no one that I don't love, period. If you're a Christian, by any means, you ought to be able to say that, can't you? And be telling the truth. Do you have to fudge to say that? Are there people you don't love? You need to be born again. Because love is what you get at the new birth. It's not a magic spirit. It's love. It's the power of God. So what is the rock? Peter's not the, the, the rock that the church is built on. The rock that the church is built on is the spiritual revelation and the confession that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God. So I ask you, who is Jesus? Is He the Son of the living God? Then you are part of this church. His church. The only church. There isn't but one. A lot of different denominations. A lot of different groups. But I've noticed these little splinter groups. They're the, when you talk to the groups, they're the only group. And all the other groups are wrong. Here's a clue for you. Any group that tells you that they're the ones, they are not the ones. No, no. There is not but one. There is not but one. Being a Catholic, Protestant, any of that means nothing to me. It means totally nothing. Nothing. It's irrelevant. That's a sideline I don't need. Christ and Him crucified. That's it. Now you can get that out of most churches. You may not like what goes with it, but most churches do believe that. Any real church has to by definition. Jesus accepts us and uses us despite our shortcomings, our doubts, and our denials are transformed into faith and courage for his name's sake. So we have doubters and deniers. <laughs> Mary Magdalene had a past. Is there anybody here that doesn't have one? I'll give you mine if you need. <laughs> you could do better. Mary Magdalene's past haunted her, making her feel unworthy of Jesus' of Jesus' love and acceptance. Yet, yet the first witness of Jesus' resurrection was not a Sunday school teacher, but a former prostitute who suffered from demon possession until Jesus delivered her by his love. The very first witness. This is important. It was no coincidence that the first embrace from the resurrected Lord was with Mary Magdalene. We are all Mary Magdalene. We are all Barabbas. But we are all in his embrace. I never heard him say he hated a man yet or would even turn away a man. Until he does, I'm staying with him. 
The testimonies, I don't know if you know this, the testimonies of women were not generally accepted in courts of law. Instead, they were, the women were represented by male guardians with few exceptions. You see that today in Muslim culture and Eastern culture and things like this. It's very strict in a lot of ways. You, you know, if a woman goes out of the house, you have to have a male escort or something like that. And I don't want, I'm, not, I'm not interested in a bunch of that. But just to let you know, not everything is the United States. This is not a United States gospel, although it includes the United States. If the resurrection of Jesus was a conspiracy to deceive or a hoax, they certainly would not have chosen these women as their first witnesses because they weren't even allowed to be witnesses. So, we're going to read the Bible again. John chapter 4. you don't have one, borrow one. And tell me, don't be such a smart aleck. You're wasting your breath. <laughs> John chapter 4, when Jesus realized that the Pharisees were aware he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, Although it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. Jesus never baptized anyone, but he himself was baptized. He left Judea and returned to Galilee. Now, now he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, or Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Since Jacob's well was there, Jesus, weary from his journey, sat down by the well. It was about the sixth hour. You all know what the sixth hour is now? After Easter and Palm Sunday and all that? Sixth hour? I'll wait. Thank you. Twelve o'clock now. <laughs> when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said, You are a Jew, said the woman. How can you ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I doubt that there's a people ever, I might be wrong on this, I don't know. I doubt that there's a ethnic group of people. I'm just call, I'm talking about national Jews. I doubt that there's a group of people on earth who are more biased against all other groups than probably the Jewish people. Just as a matter of demographics. You are either a Jew or a dog. This is from the New Testament. You're either a Jew, there are only two kind of people, Jews or sinners. Jews or Gentiles. That's it. Jews or outside the kingdom. You have no part. Jews or without God. Now this is the prevailing religious culture this is this is a different this is this is different from anything we know of Jews do not associate with Samaritans Jesus answered if you knew the gift of God and who it is and who it is asking you for a drink you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. I want to say something here so I don't forget it before my time is up which it looks like now Solomon used the phrase, an evil under the sun. So I want to use that. This is not in the script. I see two evils under the sun among the Christians. Among Christians, I see bias 
against Jews on the one hand. They got this thing about him murdering Christ or something. But they're Jews. On the other hand, I see Christians who rubber stamp anything if it says Israel or Jews on it. These are two evils under the sun. You have no idea what you're talking about or what you're doing or saying in either direction. If you knew anything about Christ, you would know that in Christ there is neither. There are no biases at all. Not gender, male nor female, and that's the only two genders. I hope you knew that. God, I hope I don't have to start over here. Okay, we got that one down. To make issues either way. I see Christians, honest, that just, if it says Israel or Jews, they just rubber stamp it, doesn't matter what it is. You have no idea what you're doing. And then on this side, I see those that, if it's a Jew, then it's got to be evil. Boy, this is, this is unacceptable. You better come back to the cross. You better come back to Paul's gospel. Christ and him crucified, and you better get out of and stay out of this other stuff. It's not your business. It's not your call. Leave it to God. It's a distraction to you. It won't make you a better Christian. Sorry for running over there. I don't even know where I am now. I know I can't get out from here. So. <laughs> Whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up in eternal life. If he gives you a drink. Oh, you got an ocean inside now. Well, not an ocean. You couldn't drink that, but you know. Clear water. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not go thirsty and have to come home, keep coming here to draw water. She was a Samaritan woman who waited for the heat of the day. Twelve noon. So when she came, the Jews wouldn't be there to harass her. She was a prostitute or a Samaritan. It's worse. So she waited till the coast was clear, and then there's Jesus. Or was it ever clear? Jesus told her, Go, call your husband and come back. <laughs> I have no husband, the woman replied. Jesus said to her, You're correct to say that you have no husband. In fact, you have had five husbands. And the one you now have is not your husband. You have spoken truthfully. Sir, the woman said, I see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place where one must worship is in Jerusalem. Believe me, woman, Jesus replied, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. Now listen to me. For salvation is from the Jews. To the Jew first, and then to the Greek. In case you didn't know, the Savior of the world is a Jew. A Jew saved the world. 
It's a Jew that you worship every Sunday. If you hate Jews, boy, do you have a problem. I started something I could never finish, didn't I? Yeah, sorry. Use your brain for something. Why not just call everything even? Why not just follow the Bible? Why not just stay where he puts you in the middle? Why get off in the fringes of every cockamamie? Is that a word? That's a word. Somebody you don't even know trying to sell you something you don't want to buy or maybe you do. What is wrong with us? What is wrong is we've abandoned this and went after everything else that's just like it. Just as good as, maybe even better. And we know zero, flat out zero, about what's between the covers of this book. No wonder the world is a powder keg. No wonder. Paul was right. He was right all along. Stay out of the weeds. Get back on the road. Follow Christ. I'm just going to quit because I'm out of time. I got <laughs> ten more sermons. I can't do it. But I will say this to you. I love you. And I expect to see every one of you Wednesday night. <laughs> seven o'clock. And that, that is not laughable. Don't laugh. That'll happen. Amen. God bless you and thank you very much. Bye-bye for now.